All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome students and welcome uh, parents and friends that are joining on the uh, live stream. Uh, we appreciate you being here and we are excited about this. We had to cancel last year's due to the pandemic uh, and we said that we have to do a ceremony this year. So uh, we are uh, super thrilled that you guys are here. A couple of housekeeping items first. You guys see the QR codes and the links on your tables. If you'd like to share that with any of your friends and family, okay, uh, please do send that link out. Uh, that way people can watch it on the live stream. And also this live stream will be posted to our Facebook page and our YouTube page afterwards, just in case anybody wants to watch it after. Also, uh, the brief overview of what we're going to do tonight. So I'm going to uh, start by uh, talking on behalf of the faculty and staff. We'll have uh, President Jagger uh, tell her story and share a, a few words of wisdom. And then we'll uh, award all of you your lab coats. So let's start. We're going to start with an uh, opening prayer. But in place of an opening prayer, uh, we're going to actually read a uh, parable from the Gospel of Matthew. And it's the story of three servants. So the kingdom is also like what happened when a man went away and put his three servants in charge of all he owned. The man knew what each servant could do. So he handed 5,000 coins to the first servant, 2,000 to the second, and 1,000 to the third. And then he left the country. As soon as the man had gone, the servant with 5,000 coins used them to earn 5,000 more. The servant who had 2,000 coins did the same with his money and earned 2,000 more. But the servant with 1,000 coins dug a hole and hid his master's money in the ground. Sometime later, the master of those servants returned. He called them in and asked what they had done with his money. The servant who had been given 5,000 coins brought them in with 5,000 that he had earned. He said, sir, you gave me 5,000 coins and I have earned 5,000 more. Wonderful, his master replied. You are a good and faithful servant. I left you in charge of only a little, but now I will put you in charge of much more. Come and share in my happiness. Next, the servant who had been given 2,000 coins came in and said, Sir, you gave me 2,000 coins and I have earned 2,000 more. Wonderful, his master replied. You are a good and faithful servant. I left you in charge of only a little, but now I will put you in charge of much more. Come and share in my happiness. The servant who had been given 1,000 coins then came in and said, Sir, I know that you are hard to get along with. You harvest what you don't plant and gather crops where you haven't scattered seed. I was frightened and went out and hid your money in the ground. Here is every single coin returned. The master of the servant told him, you are lazy and good for nothing. You know that, har that I harvest what I don't plant and gather crops where I haven't scattered seed. You could have at least put my money in the bank so that I could have earned interest on it. Now, you might think that's kind of a weird way to start a lab coat ceremony, okay? Uh, this is not a theology talk that you came to. Uh, we have uh, come here to succeed, or come here to be excited, right, for all of your accomplishments, okay? But on behalf of the faculty and staff, we just want to say a couple uh, words uh, to all of you that have worked so hard to get here. So why would I start with that particular parable? Well, there's a lot of many reasons uh, why I would why I think that particular parable is a good place to start, and why, you might ask, right? So first, at the beginning of the story, it states, the man knew what each servant could do. In other words, the master gives out different amounts of money to each servant according to his or her abilities. Well, just a short, maybe one or two or three or four years ago, each of you showed up at Newman, with different backgrounds and different life experiences. No doubt Newman University offered you probably different amounts of scholarships to attend because we are not all created with equal skills and abilities, nor granted the same opportunities. Regardless, each of you chose to attend Newman. So on behalf of the faculty and staff at Newman University, thank you for choosing Newman to be the place that you chose to share your unique abilities and skills. The faculty and staff are very ever mindful that we do not get to share our passion 
for biology and biochemistry and chemistry and mathematics and yes, even physics, if we don't have you the student. So the first thing we're celebrating tonight is for you to choose Newman, not only the first time, but every single semester to choose Newman as the place that you have chose to pursue your education and to grow your career. So let's second, let's actually, let's jump to the end of the parable and speak briefly about that wicked and lazy servant. So let me be clear, there is not a single student receiving a lab coat ceremony this evening that could be considered that lazy student. Let me explain why. This third servant received the least, yet the master still gave him money. A significant amount of money, right? The master must have believed that he had the talent and skill to increase that money. However, out of fear, he chose to do nothing. Fear inhibits success. Success only occurs when you overcome fear and take action. And to be sure, you guys may have indeed been terrified of, say, endless stoichiometric calculations and general chemistry. Maybe you were terrified of the Krebs cycle or the organic reaction wheel or derivatives or integrals or simply the physics equation sheet or just fearful of Dr. Bradley himself. <laughs> but you ever came all of those fears, right? You took actions and succeeded. You have spent countless hours studying and procrastinating and studying and procrastinating in Bishop Gerber Science Center, usually well into the evening. And each and every one of you passed some of very difficult courses. So the second reason we're here tonight is to celebrate your successes and accomplishments as a science student. So congratulations, right, as a junior and senior receiving these lab coats. These aren't something that we give out to freshmen and sophomores. Third, if you are not the lazy and the wicked servant, then which servant are you? Are you the first servant who received 5,000 or the second servant who received 2,000? See, when I look around the room, I know most of you personally. I see students that earn their place on the dean's list right, nearly every semester. And I also see students that worked endless hours right, simply to pass a course. My question is, is one student better than the other? I see students that served in leadership roles, president, vice president, secretary positions for NUMSI, for chemistry club, for STEM club, gardening club, right? all of these other clubs that we have on campus. And I see other students that would normally show up for, I don't know, maybe the food and good fellowship at those club activities. My question again, right, is one student better than the other? I also see students that served as teaching assistants and students that were taught by teaching assistants. I see students that worked as peer tutors and students that met with peer tutors. So when I read this parable, I wonder which servant was most successful. And as you may be wondering, right, which students here are most successful? But then a good thing happens. My analytical skills kick in, right, and I start to uh, calculate uh, the return of investment for each one of these servants. And each one of these servants had a 100% return on investment. The 5,000, the servant that received 5,000 gained 5,000. The servant that received 2,000 turned it into 4,000. In other words, they were both equally successful and they both doubled their master's money. I would like to think that the two servants worked together to double the money. Just like I see students in this science department at this university, in this community, right, constantly helping each other to succeed. So the third reason, right, that we're here tonight is to acknowledge your effort and an improvement that have, you have undergone. It has not gone unnoticed, right? It's so fun to watch students come in as a freshman, right, and grow throughout the years in their knowledge and in their skills and their abilities. So we are proud of your improvement as coming in as a freshman to your, to your time now. Fourth, the parable goes, does not give any details as to how the first and second servant doubled their money. So I have a lot of questions whenever I read it. I wonder, did they double the money as a result of hard work 
or was it luck or maybe possibly both? I don't know about you, but maybe uh, you studied really hard, but every once in a while got lucky on a multiple choice exam. Maybe. Did every investment that they made give positive returns, or did some investments maybe lose money? Did they double it quickly, or did it take years and years to get that investment to pay off? I also wonder, did the first and second servants work alone, or did they work together to double their money? And I would assume that if they lived a particular normal life, I imagine that they experienced challenges, obstacles, setbacks, and of course, successes. In other words, their path to success probably was not always smooth and easy. I imagine they needed each other to succeed. So the fourth reason, right, why we are here tonight is to celebrate your grit in overcoming adversity for getting yourself up when there were challenges that you had to overcome. After all, you guys are sitting here with masks on, social distance, in the midst of a pandemic. That's a pretty big accomplishment to overcome in your junior and senior year. And you overcame it together. Lastly, I'm almost finished. I wonder how long it did take for that particular master to return. How much time was given to the servants to double their money? Maybe it took many, many, many years. Maybe more than four or five years. That is longer than it takes to earn a particular science degree. The last reason we're here tonight awarding you lab coats is to motivate you and younger students who now look up to you to keep working and to keep improving. After all, you have, well, you know, you don't need reminded of this, but you have finals coming up in a couple of weeks. You have job applications to complete, professional degrees to obtain, et cetera, et cetera. There is more work to be done. So please know that the faculty in the Newman University Science Department believe you have the talent, work ethic, and passion to go out and transform society. Continue to invest in yourself and to serve one another so that whenever that master returns, you will hear those glorious words, you are a good and faithful servant. Come and share in my happiness. At this time, um, I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Bradley, if he'd like to say anything on behalf of the faculty and staff. No. No. Okay. All right. We will move on then. And we'll go with uh, President Jagger. President Jagger is new this year. This is her first year. So hopefully most of you have gotten uh, to know her or seen her around campus. I just have a short introduction so you can get to know a little bit more about her. President Jagger is the second laywoman to serve as Newman University president. She has extensive higher education and leadership experience, including acting as president, vice president, and dean at Thomas More University in Crest uh, View Hills, Kentucky. She also taught at DePaul University in Indiana and Transylvania University in Kentucky. Jagger earned her PhD in, get this, microbiology from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. She also holds a master's degree in public health from the Harvard, Harvard School of Public Health and a BA in zoology from DePaul University. In addition to being an active member, active volunteer, and advocate for Habitat for Humanity, Jagger has also served on the board of, or volunteered for more than 20 community organizations. She is married to Dr. Dim, Dr. Jim Jagger, who formerly served as Director of Athletic Medicine and Team Doctor for the University of Kentucky Athletics. They have two grown sons, Matthew and Mark. So, President Jagger. So as a scientist myself, I wanted to give you, uh, you know, Ryan asked for some words of wisdom, uh, a few words of wisdom and just a little bit of my story so you can see uh, one view of how science careers develop. And I do want to thank Dr. Hushka to ask me to come and speak tonight because you're my clan, right? The science students are 
people I associate with most. Um, I think the idea for this ceremony is really quite special. I don't know of any other place that does this to honor their students surviving those two first and tough years uh, of the science curriculum. But I think it's also uh, a bit of a warning to reach this point because you are at a juncture where if you continue on this path, you may realize more and more as you study in every course and in every year that goes by how little we really know about science. So you come in thinking, you know, science has it all down. And as you get deeper and deeper into whatever discipline you're studying, you realize, boy, there's so much more that we really have to learn and to figure out. So that's good news for those of you that want to stay in the sciences and continue on this discovery path. I do remember one year when I was teaching immunology that a student asked a question about something that immunologists had not yet sorted out. I don't even remember um, you know, what the question was, something about histocompatibility. But anyway, um, when she asked this question, I thought it was very, very clever. And I told her that would be a great topic for her graduate school dissertation. And so I don't know if you've had those experiences yet, where you get far enough in some of your advanced classes that you really are thinking in the same way that someone who's currently in the scientific professions would be thinking. That student told me later that in that moment she really believed she could become a scientist because she was curious beyond the level of the information in her textbook. And it no longer seemed an impossible task to ask a new question or figure out a particular problem. You have the potential in college, in a setting like Newman, to really feel the thrill of discovery if you're doing research with one of your faculty members or doing some open-ended research even in some of your classes. And even if not practically experiencing that, you may theoretically in thinking about the problems that scientists consider. So how did I get interested in science? Do you all remember how old you were when you first thought you would, you would, you would become a scientist, you felt like a scientist? How old were you? Anybody? You're, nobody's thought about being a scientist yet? Seven? Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying this is cool, right? Yeah. Anybody else? Magic school bus. Awesome. Yeah. And, and sometimes there's other clues just by your behaviors, right? Like uh, the one I see in my grandkids. Do they pick up the rock on the sidewalk and look and see what's on the underside of it? Or do they just kick it out of the way? Right? One is the jock who wants to kick it out of the way, and the other one, my two grandkids, wants to pick it up and see if there's any, any of those squirrely wiggly things on the bottom of the rock. So you can tell at an early age sometimes. But my first declared interest in science when I was about 10, I was put in the hospital uh, to try to figure out what was wrong with me. I was having really severe abdominal uh, pains and they couldn't figure out what it was. And I was in the hospital for mm, four or five days and I was really more interested in asking questions when the doctors came in. And I'm sure they were annoyed by the questions this 10-year-old was asking. Uh, and I, I kept saying things like, well, what are you putting these plastic, um, what are you putting these leads on my head for? Why are you gluing them on? What is that going to tell you? Right? What is that information all about? And so I thought, I'd, they, I'm sure they thought I was just an annoying little kid. But understanding how that EEG machine worked, understanding the particular medications they were giving me that made me feel differently. Um, those were the questions that were of more interest to me than you know, ultimately what was really wrong and was I going to feel better. So it all turned out well. Uh, I was diagnosed with epilepsy. Um, they gave me meds and I outgrew it in about six years. But this whole experience really piqued my curiosity about medicine. So from the time I was 10, I knew I was going to be a doctor and this was going to be the area for me to study. Well, all the way through high school, 
I kept getting more and more interested in the sciences, although I was never good at memorizing things. And I know I've had a lot of students that tell me when they're first year students, I want to go into science because I'm good at memorizing things. But lo and behold, there's some rote memorization. But when you get to the college level and you get past those first couple of courses, right, the amount of rote memorization is decreasing. You just learn the language. And now it's really more about questions and how things work and why things behave the way they do. Or um, as we were saying earlier, you know, recognize the beauty in a mathematical proof. These things are not just, you know, plug and chug, fill in the blanks and memorize. And so when I got into college, I figured out science is really not what I thought it was in earlier grades. And I liked it even more. Um, I liked the fact that science was not fixed, that it changes what we know as truth today, what we think we understand may not be tomorrow or next year or three years from now. And that's exciting in, in any of the health professions that you're looking at because that means you continue to learn in your profession you know, and discover more and figure out problems um, that we don't have answers to today. The other thing I found out in, in, uh, in college about science is it was very creative. Now, a lot of people, you know, they talk about this right brain, left brain thing, you're either creative or you're logical and you can't be both, you know, that's a bunch of hogwash, right? Because science is a very creative process and it allows you to imagine how you might go about solving a particular problem, or it allows you to imagine how a particular uh, process might work. I remember I, I took organic chemistry, I confess, in summer school because I couldn't fit into my schedule. And I was at Northwestern in Chicago, and, and our final exam was, you have these reagents on their shelf, these are the things you're starting with, give me 10 ways to make this some final product. And that was another example to me of, you know, science is creativity. It, it's thinking about how can you get from from A to B, or make some good explanations for um, something that you're curious about. And that's the other thing that I learned. Science is for the curious. So all of you get gold stars in curiosity if you've made it this far in the sciences. And for those of you who like to ask the how questions and the why questions, um, you know, this is, this is what you want to continue to nurture if you go on and use your science, whether or not it's for your vocation or an avocation. Um, when I was in, uh, the, I think it was summer after my sophomore year, I worked in an infectious disease research lab in, um, in Chicago. And I, I had many interesting experiences there. And I was mentored by a woman who had a master's degree in science. And our job, our research job, was really to do research on the patients that were in the hospital and things that they needed. Um, more information about. And I'll never forget this one patient who uh, they were getting ready to take to surgery. And oftentimes we would have to go gown up in surgery and get specimens and come down the lab and, and grow them and figure out um, more about them. But this one kid was a young kid. He was about 12, I think. And he had climbed up this utility pole and started to fall. And when he did, he grabbed the wire and hit his head on the back of a trans transformer, closing a circuit and blowing off the back of his skull. Comes into the emergency room, and you know he he was uh, you know he he didn't die number one uh, from that explosion, but it did put him in a very vulnerable place because your your brain is protected right by multiple layers of connective tissue, but also you know this rock hard structure that that um, really. Uh, keeps it safe. And you lose that skull and you're in big trouble. So uh, they, right when they were getting ready to take him to surgery to implant a metal piece on his skull, um, they uh, found that he had an infection on the surface of those connective tissue layers in his brain. And they could not close up the skull and create this sort of anaerobic environment with that infection growing there. So we, we took the sample down to the lab of this organism, it was a, a really nasty enterococcus. Some of you may have done these assays, you do the disc assays where you streak microbe on a plate and put the discs on and see if it inhibits growth, right? Um, and so every single thing that we had to test it against, it was resistant, resistant to every drug. So we spent literally about 12 hours 
setting up combinations, standard and non-standard combinations of antibiotics to test what might work um, if we tried multiple drugs at the same time. And this is not that simple disassay. This you have to mix different amounts and different dilutions and figure out if it's killing it or just stopping its growth and, um, you know, complicated test, test tube assays, which nowadays we can do much more quickly. This was a long time ago, though. And after allowing time for growth, about 26 hours or 36 hours later, we did find a non-standard combination of antibiotics that could work against this organism to prevent its growth uh, at a level that we could achieve clinically in the patient. And so to make that story, you know, come, come to a conclusion there, um, the patient was on this antibiotic regimen for about three days, at which point they felt they could go ahead and do the surgery, and put the plate on his skull. And as far as we ever knew, the, the patient did well beyond that. But this whole experience, you know, you've, you've felt stressed before, stressed for an exam, stressed for a whatever, but this was an experience where I felt stressed about a kid's life, you know, and whether he was going to make it um, over the next several days. And instead of being afraid, like you talked about, I was, I was thought, this is just so cool. I was energized. I was forever a lab rat after that. You know, I couldn't get enough time um, trying things out in the laboratory. My junior and senior year, I worked as a lab assistant uh, in, in college. And at that time, I figured out how much I loved both doing the research and teaching. So my plans to go to medical school, I had applied. It was middle of senior year and I, when I finally had this awakening. I said, oh, I don't think I'm going to go to medical school. I'm going to go to grad school. You can imagine my parents, who they've been listening to me for, since I was 10, right? I'm going to go to medical school. My dad was just like, why don't you just wait and see if you get accepted and then withdraw your applications? <laughs> Um, it was a big transition for my parents to, to see me in a different way. But, you know, I did withdraw the applications without waiting to hear because I knew what I wanted to do. Um, took a risk, uh, submitted applications to graduate school, went to Cincinnati for the simple reason that um, I could do my graduate work at a medical center and they gave me the best offer financially. Um, and uh, never really felt sorry about making that change. Uh, something I thought for a very long time was going to be my career, just overnight. So uh, when I was in graduate school, I did more microbiology research. I did research on, on how microorganisms were able to cause disease, studying a particular one that was a very common infection in, in burn wound patients, but is also is found in nature everywhere. And so why in these, these patients was it suddenly killing people when in nature it wasn't? Um, so again, uh, that was a very, very interesting process and something that, um, you know, I was able to finish in about three and a half years. My first job was teaching in a medical school. How about that for you, right? You think you're going to be the medical student and then I end up teaching medical students. So that was kind of, you know, a different twist on my plan, but the rest since then has been a roller coaster ride. And so some of the morals of this story, I guess, or some of the tips that I take home from that is be really flexible and be self-aware in thinking about how science can play a role in your future. It's, it's certainly possible you might combine science with some other area. And I like to use the example of, of com if you like to write. Does anybody here like to write? Any writers? Come on, you can, all right. So you love to write and you love science, what's a great career for you? S science writing, right? I mean, we need people who can communicate science to the general public. We need them badly. Because sometimes scientists aren't the best at communicating to the general public. They're not as good as they are communicating with each other. So think about what are the things you love and how do those combine you know, into future possibilities for yourself? Second thing I would say is you know, some of you are seniors. How many are seniors that are almost done? Well, you've already got your next step probably planned, right? Job, grad school, something like that. But I would say uh, both to you that are starting on a new track um, and those that are still coming back again the next year, enjoy the ride. And what do I mean by that? The process of becoming a scientist, right? You need to appreciate every moment in that process to fully understand 
why this is good for you, why it's a good fit for you, right? Don't be obsessed with just checking off that graduation requirement or that major requirement or that med school requirement. You know, take that course and dig in in every way. Be really open to what you're learning that you didn't think you were going to learn. Um, and even the things that you think are boring as heck, right? Figure out why those are important um, and, and be in the moment. Don't be in a hurry to check off the boxes. The third thing I think I learned about science is look beyond the facts, right? In your first two years, there is a fair amount of, you know, get what's in the textbook in your head and try to keep it there, right? Try to reason through it so you remember it. But you reach a point somewhere, probably in your junior year, your senior year, when you go to grad school or when you go into your, your other um, science-related professions, that you start to be able to look at the facts and say, that's interesting, but what else? Right next, what are those questions that you want to ask? When you get to that point, then you really have reached the point of being an acting, functioning, real scientist, right? So if you're the one that's always asking questions, you're well on your way, but keep asking those questions because it's the curiosity of scientists that moves science forward. And, of course, the ability to convince your peers that what you figured out is really the truth. One of the things I think is undeniable, when you're, when you're studying something and you realize for the very first time that you know something that nobody else in the world knows yet. You've just figured something out that's not in a textbook. It's not in a scientific journal anywhere. And you're going to publish it. You're going to give presentations at meetings and tell people about what you figured out. And that is a total joy ride, right? Figuring out something first on your own because there's your own curiosity. So keep that. And, and I do think that one of the ways you can figure out the, the myriad ways that you can enter into scientific professions is by taking the time, and I think this is a really good summer option. You don't have time during the school year, right? You barely get your reading for classes done. But in the summer, if you're not taking classes, I strongly recommend that you read a biography or two uh, about scientists or read some of the original seminal works in the area that you're studying. So we have biologists here. How many of you ever read Darwin? Good for you, right? Maybe you have it in a seminar class or whatever. Um, you know, origin of the species is not really about origin of the species, right? That comes later. So, you know, what we know um, indirectly is, is nothing like what you can read directly. And so I want to give you a couple of suggestions. Um, read Darwin, read Newton, right? Consider people like Lavoisier or Madame Curie, or Einstein, or one of my favorites in biology, Barbara McClintock. We think about science as being a completely social endeavor because you figure things out, but then you have to talk to other people about them, right? Or sometimes you figure it out in a group. And her work was done almost entirely by herself. And she had a heck of a time convincing other people that what she found out, genes jumping around in chromosomes, was really true. Um, so her life story, there's a great biography of her that you could read, and it's inspiring. One of my favorite um, scientists is E.O. Wilson. He's a sociobiologist from Harvard. And, um, and then there's Sean Carroll, used to be head of the Har uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute in Washington. And then one of my other favorite authors is a former student of mine, and his name is, is Jay Nichols. And he wrote a book titled um, Blue Mind. And it's all about the surprising science that shows how being near, in, on, or underwater can make you happier, healthier, uh, more connected, and better at what you do in life. He literally uh, is one of those guys that saves the turtles. I mean, he's working on the West Coast. But he's also a very curious individual. And he is interested in this connection between you know, the psychological reactions people have, the neurophysiological reactions people have when they're in and around water. And he did research way beyond his field, put it all together in this book called Blue Mind. So 
If you like water, if you like being in, on, or under it, that's a book you really should read. And it's a little bit of a biography for him. Sean Carroll has a book, if you haven't heard of it, called um, Endless Forms Most Beautiful. And it's about evolution and, and development and how those two are connected. It's a beautiful story. Um, he also wrote a book, Sean Carroll also wrote uh, Making the Fittest, I think, or Make, Making of the Fittest, something like that. That really has to do with a more current interpretation of, you know, how do we use DNA to solve crimes and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then a last one I would recommend, there's a woman by the name of Lynn Margulis who um, wrote a book called The Symbiotic Planet. And although Darwin's theory of evolution laid a lot of the foundations for modern biology, um, Margulis has really uh, worked hard on the original life itself uh, from a biological perspective. So. These are just some insights, and if you're looking for, for great summer reading, I haven't finished unpacking all my boxes that are in my garage. I will be bringing some of these books to my office. So if you want to come by, and you're coming back in the fall, you want to come by and pick up a book, borrow one for summer reading. I'm sure I have a lot you could borrow, and I'm sure your faculty probably have books in their office like this that would be fun for you to read, and they might even loan them to you for the summer. So rather than tea, you know, spending your summer just being relieved that you're not reading a textbook or scientific paper or whatever, pick up something that is really intended for a broader audience to see science in a new light. Um, there's a lot of really good readings out there. I bet your faculty could come up with a good list of other suggestions. So anyway, that's my story. Even if you are not going to continue in the world of science, it will become your avocation in some ways. You will always read that article in the New York Times, right, about the pandemic that's starting that we think came from China a year ago, right? You will always be on the alert for those scientific articles. So it doesn't really matter if you become a physician, a physical therapist, a genetic counselor, uh, a researcher at Pfizer that's developing new vaccines, or a banker or an architect, or whatever it is that you end up with in your professions. Keep the curiosity that you've learned, or that, that's maybe innate with you, keep that curiosity about science alive. There's so much more we have to learn on this planet and beyond, and it's just, it's fun. So keep it going. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, President Jagger. And now we get to go to the uh, main event, right? Uh, the reason you guys have all uh, come here uh, tonight. So here's how this is going to work. Uh, we're going to call your name. Okay, you're going to walk up from wherever you're at, left side of the room, right side of the room. Okay, if you walk up right here, okay, we're going to have a faculty member that is going to put that uh, coat on you. Okay, you get to walk down this center aisle, if you would, after you receive your lab coat, right? Smiling underneath your mask, of course. And go over there, okay, to the uh, photo station in the back. You can then remove your mask, okay, and take a uh, picture with your lab coat on, right? Again, uh, smiling, uh, showing how proud you are of uh, your accomplishments, as well as your ability to get through uh, this very difficult year. Okay. After that, uh, sit back down, and maybe the part that I forgot uh, to mention is that after I uh, call each name and as you're walking up, it would be awesome right, to hear this place very, very loud. Okay. I don't like awkward silences, okay? and we're here to celebrate, okay? and I also don't like when audiences kind of you know, do this really, really excited at the beginning, and then by the last person, a couple people clap. So we're going to try to keep the energy up okay, as we're going through these particular names, uh, so that way we can uh, make this a ceremony. All right. Let me find my list. So starting us off, is Elijah Klein here? Elijah Klein. There we go. I like that.
Min Win. Good Min. Talia Powers. Next up, Gabrielle Altenor. <laughs> Aubrey Ashley. Lily Balderas. All right, next up, I uh, got an athlete here, so he'd really like to have a loud applause uh, here, uh, Chase Bowman. Next up, Madison Buchel. Kira Butler. Riley Kane. <laughs> Ellie Clifton. Madeline Conrad. Congratulations, Madeline. Morgan Cooper. Congratulations, Morgan. John Kufal. Madeline Davis. Christian De Hoot. I didn't see Alex, all right. Logan Dickey.
Jenny Duong. Michaela Imke. Lauren Asfeld. Moret Estefanos. Mac Foley. Andres Garcia. Tati Tierra Gary. Shanice Gatunko. A Johnny Greenway. Morgan Gunnerson. All right, so we're halfway, almost, well, we're a little halfway through, so let's keep the uh, applause coming. Dawson Gunter. Congrats, Dawson. Sarah Gutnick. Brooke Haney. Miranda Hayes. Hubert. <laughs> Karis Hughes. Sophie Johnston. Jada Key.
Savannah Kaiser. Daniel Nola. Katie Krause. Trang Lam. Kenny Lee. Congrats, Kenny. Diana Lee. Claire Leva. <laughs> Stephania Lopez. <laughs> Brittany Ma. Carolina Mariscal. <laughs> Marie Moore. Congrats. Leslie Wynn. Nope, I don't see Leslie. I don't see Leslie. Okay. Daniel Oberly. All right, I don't see Daniel either. Michaela Ortiz. Congratulations, Michaela. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Jason Palacios. <laughs> All right. Mia Pasquale. Cray Fawn and Steel. <laughs> Congratulations, Craig. 
Alyssa Pham. Kathy Pham. All right, now it's nice and loud. Daniela Renteria. Congrats. Pedro Rivera. Congratulations. Eliza Robles. Nicole Romero. <laughs> Reagan Roth. Maddie Schindler. <laughs> McKenna Small. Ethan Schmidt. No, I'll go. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I didn't see the arrow. <laughs> Congrats, Ethan. Ashley Schmidt. Congrats, Ashley. McKenna Schroeder. Alexis Seguera. Madison Shea. <laughs> Hannah Schubert. Sheridan Summer. Congratulations. Congrats. 
Jody Sosa. Emma Springer. Congrats, Emma. Kelby Stoniker. Jacob Stoneberger. Morgan Stwally. Catherine Sullivan. Congrats, Catherine. Magalay Sestadia. Congratulations. <laughs> Shayla Tope. <laughs> Nick Vasilescu. Anna Veltin. <laughs> Preston Wintz. Caroline Williams. <laughs> Presley Williams. <laughs> Lastly, but certainly not least, Kenneth Wright. There's a line back there for pictures, and that's okay. Uh, and I don't want to hold up uh, the rest uh, of the show. So uh, if you're standing back in there in line, please uh, pay attention as we uh, wrap up tonight. Um, forgot to mention uh, this person uh, the first go around, uh, but would uh, Heather Perkins please stand up?
For those of you that don't know Heather, please stop in, obviously, and see uh, Heather uh, this year. She's uh, uh, new to us since, uh, well, last year. Uh, so uh, a lot of you might not have been in person and stopped by our office, but uh, she is responsible for the vast majority of work that went into this particular program tonight. So again, thank you, Heather. All right, I don't want to keep uh, my, I don't want to stand in the way between uh, me and, or between you and the reception. So uh, there is uh, cookies, punch, and water over in the uh, student center. So I invite you uh, to go over there. We have plenty, so please grab as many as you'd like. Um, one last time, I want to have a big uh, round of applause and congratulations to all of you for being here tonight.